Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're a little late, but we're going to start now. Um, it is Wednesday, February 15th, 624, and we will open the meeting of the CDAC. We have a full house tonight. We welcome you. Um, we hope this will be an interesting process for you. And we will go right into our presentations. Our first presentation after, after we do, after we do, I always forget this part. After we do um, attendance, we will, we will start with our first presenter who is Metro Interfaith. So John, we, may we begin with you? John Brunza, mayoral appointee. Brandy Brown, District 3. Justin McGregor, District 7 and Secretary. Kenya Middleton, Vice Chair, Mayor Appointee. Marianne Callahan, 1st District. Michelle O'Loughlin, 6th District, or 5th, sorry, 5th. <laughs> Carolyn Austin, 6th District. Jacob Kumpan, Council at Large. Thank you. Okay, our first presenter from Metro Interfaith. The rules of the game are about a five minute presentation with about five minutes for questions and answers by the committee. Um, but no, no hooks come down if you go over that time. So please don't worry. Good evening. And you need to keep the microphone tremendously close ah, great. to be heard. Is that okay? Yeah. Terrific. Good evening. Put it down a little bit more. Oh, sure. Yeah, because they have trouble sometimes in the back hearing. We good? Excellent. Thank okay. you. Thank you. How are we doing tonight, everyone? Good. 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 My name is Conan Smith. I'm the uh, CEO of Metro Interfaith. Thanks for having me here tonight. So uh, you would like to hear more about the Binghamton Home Ownership Academy, I believe. So uh, the, the Academy is a partnership that was created uh, a few administrations back um, between the City of Binghamton, Metro Interfaith, uh, Shenango Opportunities at the time, not for profit out of uh, Shenango County and Habitat for Humanity. Um, the Academy is designed to um, help uh, improve home ownership rates and the housing stock in the city of Binghamton. Um, we created the, a, a, a program to offer first time home buyer counseling and education to folks uh, interested in being homeowners within the city of Binghamton. And we also developed um, down payment assistance and closing cost assistance programs with the city of Binghamton um, and other entities um, to help improve uh, home ownership rates. And then we also um, partnered with the city of Binghamton to help administer their home repair program, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and that program offers uh, assistance to uh, homeowners within the city of Binghamton, single family homeowners within the city of Binghamton to make repairs and improvements to their home. Um, it's uh, income eligible requirements uh, for the program. So folks have to be low to moderate income household owners. And um, it's a really great program. It uh, helps helps with uh, expensive but uh, needed repairs such as roofs and foundations, uh, which are always very important for a house. So. Um, we've been, I think we've been administering the programs for about 10 years, maybe a little more than that. I kind of lost track of time to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but we're, uh, we think we do a great job of it and, and I, I believe the programs are very successful and I think, um, this, you know, we've partnered really well with the city and are, are happy to do it. And the money that you're asking us for is specifically for the program. Yeah, exactly. So um, we use the funds um, to cover the costs of administration costs, um, as well as, um, you know, providing the, the counseling and education to the folks uh, that come in. Uh, we take care of all the intake paperwork, qualifying for the folks that uh, come in the program, um, uh, postage, your, you know, your day-to-day -day costs for, of running a business. How do you find the people that attend? Uh, so that's not very hard to do. Um, we've got a pretty good name at this point for doing it for so long, really word of mouth. Um, the, the, the repair program um, is very popular, obviously, with, the, with folks within the city. So um, we probably receive, I would say, anywhere from uh, 
three to five calls a week for folks looking for assistance for repairs to their home. And uh, we, we get them all the paperwork they need to complete to get added to the waiting list. Um, and then as far as the home buyer assistance program goes, uh, we've helped uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people over, over the period of time come through the program. Um, we have plenty of, plenty of uh, good messengers out there that spread the, spread the news about the, the work that we do. So uh, we're, we, we have a class right now. We're teaching a class right now. It's, uh, it was supposed to be going on tonight. We had to cancel it tonight, but uh, I think there's 18 people enrolled in that class tonight. Mm -hmm. um, it's a five week series. It goes for five weeks. It's three and a half hours long. Um, and uh, those assuming everyone gets through the class and, and uh, graduates through the class, uh, theoretically, uh, they, as long as they're uh, prepared to uh, apply for a mortgage, potentially they could be a homeowner, you know, say within the next next three months. And they would definitely be interested in buying in the city. Ultimately, that's their goal is they want to be homeowners within the city itself. So they would be applying for the assistance funds through the city of Binghamton. Um, so it, it kind of, you know, feeds itself. Do you have a success rate that you could give us an idea of how many people go, that go through the uh, training actually are successful at the end and have a home? So that is data that I don't track or that we don't track. Um, and a lot of it is um, a lot of it hinges on ultimately what the what the the participant wants to do. So theoretically, they might complete the class. Perhaps they have to clean up some credit issues or, or work on savings. Um, and so that might hold them up from buying a house immediately, but they might they might attain all their goals and be able to purchase a home, say, in, in a year or two years from when they get through the class. Um, but we don't track that data. We, we just don't have the capacity to, to mm -hmm. track and follow people like that, unfortunately. And my last question, with the home repair program, do you have any follow-up? once the repairs are made to the house to make sure that things are being maintained by the homeowner? So actually that's not, that doesn't fall within the realm of our responsibility. Um, that that's once we complete the qualifying process for the folks, we turn the file over to the city and okay. they administer the program moving forward. So that would go to code maybe. Yep, okay. exactly. Thank you. That sure. clarifies that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I, I just had a question. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, so now how, after you complete the class, like what happens? So you go, you have the program, you do the three hour course, you look like, what do you receive after you complete the program? Yeah. So, um, you, you complete the course, you receive a certificate. Uh, the certificate is valid for a year, uh, from the, the date that it's, uh, uh, handed out. Um, so with that certificate, uh, you can use it uh, with several area banks to um, uh, apply for specific programs as far as mortgages. Um, you can also use it not only with the city's program, but you can also use it with other uh, home buyer assistance programs uh, within the area here. Um, we're a HUD certified housing counseling agency. So our certificate is, certificate is accepted um, across the country. You, they could move to Ohio if they wanted to and use our certificate to purchase a home. Um, but ultimately, I mean, we're, we're focused on trying to get folks um, to purchase homes within the city of Binghamton. So theoretically, uh, in the ideal situation, they're going to graduate. They're going to obtain their certificate. Um, they're going to go to the bank, get pre-approved for a loan. Uh, they're going to start looking for a home, uh, find a home, come to us, come back to us, apply for the city's uh, down payment assistance, closing cost assistance. And we would, we would work that through the, the system. And then ultimately, they would uh, receive money from the city of Binghamton for down payment closing cost assistance, uh, get a mortgage with a local lender, purchase a home. With the uh, housing stock being what it is now, yeah. have, have you noticed that, you know, there aren't as many houses available for them? Yeah, it's it's a it's a terrible market. Uh, okay. I was talking with my, one of my counselors today. It's there's less than. 200 homes available. It's 100 and some odd homes, which is unheard of in this area. Yeah. Uh, it's historically, historically low. So, um, and the prices it, are up too. It's ridiculous. So as a first time home buyer, uh, it's just a bad place to be, uh, right now, but we're not uh, crazy enough. Binghamton is not any different than any, any other city out yeah. there, which is really, again, unusual. 
And if your program has long-term effects on a possible home buyer, the seeds you plant will be, uh, they'll, they'll bloom someday, right? Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, so that's, that's my philosophy, I guess, is um, if we can reach out and touch these people now and, and help them get on, uh, get on the path to doing things the right way, work on improving their credit, work on saving money, uh, learn the benefit of, of managing their money well, taking care of their debts, uh, planning for the future, then yeah, okay, home ownership may not be in the cards today, but that's not to say that a year from now, two years from now, things aren't perfect and, and they can do exactly what they want to do. The eternal optimist, huh? Try to be. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Michelle? Uh, so can you tell me how many people completed the program, say, last year? Did you have a program last year? We did. Year? Yeah, last year we did. Um, so last year, I think we had a total of 60 people complete home buyer counseling, home buyer education. Do you, and you have no idea if any of them were able to buy a house? Uh, last year was not a good year. Um, I... I we did have, I know for a fact that we had at least five people purchase homes. Two were over on the east side of Binghamton. Um, I think one was out in Vestal, and I'm not sure about the other two as far as their location is now, but um, that that I know for sure. But 60 people went through. Yep. Okay. Yep. And where are those classes located? Uh, so we hold them out of our offices over on the south side of Binghamton, Lincoln Court Apartments, oh, okay. which is on uh, New Street. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. I have a question. Sure. Um, how often do you have the five-week courses? So we hold the courses five times a year. Um, so we'll be doing, like, currently we have this this course going on, and it'll end, where are we? We're in February right now. So it's going to end sometime in uh, mid-March, and then we're going to, we probably take two weeks off, and we'll start the next course theoretically beginning of April, I'll say. Um, we do take a brief break in the summertime, um, but then we wrap up uh, with two courses in the fall into close to ending around Thanksgiving. Okay, and you said that the courses are three and a half hours long. Is that a week or all together? No, uh, yeah, it's three and a half hours each class. So we're talking uh, close to 18 hours of, of education. And last question. Is this is this a program for Binghamton residents only or anybody? Anybody. Okay. Thank you. Sure. But the money that you will get from us will be you will designate that you had enough eligible Binghamtonian residents, Binghamton residents. Just for clarification for our members. Well, so because I because we do have income requirements, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And and so it's not, I can't say that we're going to focus all of the money specifically on, on Binghamton residents only, but ultimately um, the goal is to get, so we might be working with somebody from the town of Union, but if they're going to move from the town of Union into the city of Binghamton, that's a good thing okay. from our perspective. So that's, that, that's where we're, what we're trying to do. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Smith, we thank you. Thank you for your time, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you for what you do too. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, our next presenter is Mr. Willard from the First Ward Action Council. Hi, I'm Jerry Willard from the First Ward Action Council. Uh, happy to be here to talk about our home repair program, for Senior Citizens, uh, which we've been doing for more than 20 years. Um, it's been a successful program in the last couple of years. We've had some problems uh, with COVID, some other issues, but we're still doing home repairs. And uh, we think it's a much needed service in a community. We set up the program years ago to assist seniors to continue living in their own homes, uh, recognizing that there are a lot of seniors out there with very limited incomes, and it can be quite expensive trying to maintain your house. Um, in the past, uh, we've gone out and we've done very small repairs, you know, fixing leaky faucets, 
putting in handrails. Um, in addition to that, we've done larger things, building wheelchair ramps, repairing exterior stairs, a whole host of, you know, repairs that, you know, things that can go wrong or safety improvements that seniors may need around their homes. Um, the way the program works, we have a crew with two men that are employed by First Ward Ashton Council. Uh, they're handy men, you know, with a wide range of skills, and they go out and they do the actual repairs. Uh, the, the good news in the last few years has been that we've had additional money from the city of Binghamton, CDBG money, which has enabled us to uh, hire a contractor to do a job that we might not have been able to do in the past. And a good example of that would be uh, stone or brick stairs. Uh, we just, you know, we didn't have a mason. We didn't have anybody that could do that type of work. And, it, you know, it turns out there are a lot of people, if there were wood stairs, we could rebuild the stairs. Not a problem. But if there were brick or stone or concrete, it was a little more problematic. With the additional money that we received from the city, we could hire a mason or a contractor that employed a mason to go out and, uh, you know, replace, replace and rebuild those stairs. And that was an excellent, I mean, there's other types of things we can use that money for. It enables us to do repairs up to $5,000 using contractors. Uh, so there's a combination of activities, you know, the small, very small repairs that our crews will do, the bigger repairs might require more skilled, you know, uh, special skills like the stairs and even something like a, a hot water tank. Today, uh, a hot water tank could cost over $2,000. It's a lot of money. There's a lot of money for a senior citizen that's trying to maintain their house. You know, with this program, we've got some money where if they have extreme need, we could actually hire a plumber to go out and put the hot water tank in for them. And th th that's great. Now, in addition to the, the home repair program we're talking about, it's sort of an entry into our system, so to speak, uh, because we do get additional grants from the state of New York. In fact, in the last uh, couple of months, uh, we received a restore grant, which is uh, repairs, emergency repairs for senior citizens. The difference with that is it enables us to go up to $20,000 uh, which is a good chunk of change and was just raised by the state from 10 to 20. And I think part of the thinking might have been if they went to 20, you could continue to do roofs. Uh, back in the old days, you could do a roof for 10, you know, but that's very unlikely today. Uh, but anyways, we received a restore grant in the last couple of months. We received an access to home grant from the state of New York, which is to improve accessibility for, you know, not just seniors, but anybody that's disabled. Uh, with that program, we can, uh, you know, put in a new bathroom, we could uh, put in bigger doors, wheelchair ramp, you know, a whole host of things to improve accessibility. We, we received a third grant uh, for general renovations from the New York State Home Program. But anyways, the money we get from the city for our home repair service, that's for some seniors, that's sort of their entry. If we get out there and they call us for home repair and we can't do it, then with that program, we can refer them to restore or access one of these other programs and help them to get the assistance they need. So, I mean, you know, overall, the need for repairs and assistance for seniors is still there. I mean, we've got a lot of aging housing stock, as you know, in Binghamton, and uh, there's certainly people to benefit from the program. Thank you. Are there questions? Michelle. Uh, Jerry, could you just tell me again, so the, the home repair program, you said that can be repairs up to $5,000? Yeah, if, and we would go up to 5,000 if we hire a contractor. Okay. If we do it with our crew, it could be significantly less than that. Okay. And then, so like, wheelchair ramps would that be there would that be in excess of five thousand usually well the thing is with a wheelchair ramp let's say our crew builds a wheelchair ramp 
it's the, the, the senior would only have to pay for the cost of materials, but that could be like, depending on the size of the ramp, okay. that could be two or $3,000 just for the materials. Okay. Uh, if they don't have that, then we can go to, you know, providing them additional assistance, you know, to cover the cost of the materials or to hire a contractor to put the ramp in. Uh -huh. uh, if it exceeds to five, then we could bump them into the restore program or access program. And, and cover it with those funds. Okay. So, so there's, you know, we're talking about, we have several alternatives to provide assistance. So you think an average like wheelchair ramp might cost on average around $5,000, would you say? It depends, yeah, it depends. It depends on the length. I mean, the length is determined by the, the height. Right, right, yep, okay. So. All right, thank you. Um, Jerry, do you have a waiting list now? I mean, do you have a lot of clients and yeah, well, we uh, actually in the winter, for whatever reason, especially the Christmas uh, season, it slows down. I mean, it really does for whatever reason. And then it starts going like gangbusters again in the spring as we get closer to spring. Uh, so the waiting list right now is not too long. Uh, on the other hand, we've been getting a lot of calls for repairs that are bigger than what our crews can do. So we have to bump them into the other programs. But everybody on your waiting list eventually gets some what they need. Well, we hope. I mean, there's, also, there's feasibility issues in some cases. Um, you know, some things are just not possible. I mean, uh, the, the other thing is you don't run into it so much in the city of Binghamton, but we do work elsewhere. And occasionally you run into a house that is in such terrible condition that the amount of work that it needs exceeds the value of the house. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not necessarily a good investment on the part of us or whoever is providing the funding. Mm -hmm. So in, in situations like that, you could end up determining it is, is not feasible. That's an extreme case. Just one more question about um, the geographic area that you would serve, because if you say it's first ward action council, but it isn't limited to the first ward. Oh, no. Yeah, I think that, you know, just for clarification here. Yeah, one of the, uh, I mean, there are some limitations now. I mean, I, I believe HUD has been changing their guidelines. And for the last couple of years, we could not assist houses in the floodplain or even in a proposed floodplain which was eliminating a lot of people unfortunately yeah. and uh, especially in the ward yeah yeah exactly and the, the proposed floodplain uh takes in a big chunk of the first ward yeah. um my understanding after talking to steve carson is that that's been changed again and we are able to assist people in the floodplain which is good steve, news he's shaking his head so yes yeah, that's very good news. That's, uh, but uh, HUD has a way, and there's been another issue about uh, a protected species of bats on the south side of Binghamton, yeah. and we could not do repairs in that area because of this uh, threatened bat population, uh, which it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that. We can't replace a faucet because of bats. I mean. <laughs> Nothing's perfect. I guess Steve is working on that too. But, uh, He's shaking his head. That's yeah. that's a problem. That's hard to explain to a homeowner. Yeah, I can. He's upset. It's, uh, Jake, does the Binghamton money you mentioned like the state funding earlier? Does the money that you get from Binghamton like help when you're applying for that money, or like are they any way related? Yeah, sure it does because you know when we apply for the state money, we list the money that we're getting from the city of Binghamton for the home repairs. So, you know, it shows that, uh, you know, we've, we've got funding from other sources and, uh, you know, that we're, we're not just first timers when it comes to uh, doing this type of activity. Would you, John. Hello, is this uh, first come first serve or is there a level of prioritization or triage that's done to Ooh. figure out what people need and when? Yeah, we, uh, if somebody calls with an emergency, hopefully we can respond a little more quickly. But with a new level of oversight because of HUD, uh, we can't respond until we have approval from the city of Binghamton. So that at best is going to take two or three days. 
So, I mean, if somebody has a leaking hot water tank, that could be a problem. Um, but the intent, you know, if somebody has something that's really urgent, really dangerous, is to somehow get out there as soon as we can. Of the 85,000 that we give you every year, would you say you spend every penny and probably more? Yeah, I think that, uh, like I said, the last couple of years with the changes from HUD and, and COVID have been the uh, two or three of the most difficult years we've had. But uh, there's definitely need there. And I would like to think that whatever we can get in terms of funding could be spent. Any During the COVID questions? time, especially, yeah, we imagine. didn't want to go to houses. We didn't. Uh, People probably didn't want to have you at the houses either. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, it's been a difficult time. It still is to a certain extent. Yeah, but your housing stock is so precious. The housing stock that you're dealing with. Yeah. As is rev relevance by the previous speaker. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions for Mr. Willard? Jerry, thank you very okay, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want a minute? You want a minute? A minute? Our next speaker is from Fairview Recovery. Good evening. Hello. My name is Pat Haley. I'm from Fairview Recovery Services, and I'm here to talk about the Intensive Care Navigator, the Navigator Program. Um, basically, it started several years ago when uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor David uh, approached our agency and asked if there was any gap in services that we could use. Um, I think at that time it was $45,000 um, to help improve our system of, of care. And so the uh, executive director at that time uh, developed a program where, so if somebody is leaving our services and doesn't have, has to go to like the YMCA or the YWCA while they're waiting for their next level of care, um, they would have a care navigator to assist them, support them um, while they're waiting for that next bed. For for people who are new on this committee and for as a refresher for many of us, could you explain what those services are that you're talking about that you're transitioning people from? Yeah, so we are a substance use disorder agency. So they go from a, um, a crisis level to a rehab level to living out in the uh, community. Um, so they're getting substance use disorder treatment. Um, so that they can live a healthy lifestyle and get back into the workforce. Um, so the navigator themselves, you know, they're going to they're going to track this person. They're going to, you know, go see them at least once a week um, while they're waiting, help them um, navigate any systems like DSS, uh, if their Medicaid is lapsed or anything like that, um, help them to get to medical appointments, any type of um, other treatment appointments that they might have. Um, I think the goal basically is to make sure that somebody doesn't get lost in the in the shuffle and the cracks um, and that they have that support that they need uh, while they're waiting to get into that next level of care so that they don't relapse. And you are asking us for? $45,000. $45, and that would go mostly for salaries of those people who are the navigators? Um, no, it's 35,000 is for the um, navigator's salary. And then it breaks down into 8,600 for benefits. Um, mileage, we provide them up with a phone. Um, and then there's an admin cost. So you're staffing. It, it, it mostly goes to the people that are actually doing the navigating. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's sorry. Just yep. to clarify, we, we have an audience today who doesn't have the benefit of our paperwork. So we're trying gotcha. to be a little more clear. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Does anyone have any questions? Randy? Um, where's, where are you located? Fairview is located at 5 Merrick Street. It's up on the east side of Binghamton. Um, do you know where Fairview Nursing Home is? 
No. Okay. The state hospital? No, the state hospital. Uh, Greater Binghamton Health Center? It's like up. Calvin, past Calvin Coolidge School. Yeah. We're up, we're up uh, from there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Looks like we're done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I, we appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Our next presenter is from CARES. Is he okay? He's such a big man. I asked him, he said no. Oh, I have a little okay. it's, it's the maternal. <laughs> I gotcha. Good um, evening. So, good evening. How are you doing? My name is Denise Yall, and I'm the cares. Uh, good evening. I'm Andre Mathis, and I'm the board treasurer. So we have two programs that we're going to talk about. The first one is the backpack program. So I handed out the pictures of the backpack program from last year. So people had an idea of kind of how it runs. We, we go to seven locations. We give out backpacks. We kind of divide it up so people don't have to travel too far to come to us. And um, I'll let Andre continue to talk about it. Sure. Uh, so for those that are, are new to the board and for the audience, uh, so CARES is a grassroots organization uh, that was founded by community members um, to figure out a way to how to help parents um, navigate the, the the issues that they were having who live in the city, uh, within the city of Binghamton School District. Um, so CARES stands for Community Advocates Restoring Educational Standards. Um, and so our backpack giveaway is something that we've been doing since about 2016. Um, we started off as a backpack um, ice cream giveaway, which were um, funded by the mem by members uh, of CARES. We initially started off by just pooling money together uh, to buy supplies and backpacks. Um, and then since 2017, up into, until last year, we've been, been blessed to be partners with the city uh, to provide uh, funding to, to get the backpacks and the supplies uh, that we give out to a thousand uh, families throughout every summer that we've been doing this. Um, and so it has been a benefit um, we feel like for the community in order to do that, because as many who know who have students um, within school, school supplies aren't cheap, um, and it can, can be a very hard burden for a lot of families who can't afford uh, to buy school supplies, especially for large families. And so we feel like what we do is a, is a great benefit to those families just to, as a way to help them. Any questions? I don't I don't have a question, but I just want to say that we you did the backpack thing at the Noma Community Center. Yeah. Um, and it was really well received. Everybody was so happy and I'm I'm glad that you guys do it. Even today somebody came and needed a backpack. Like it, it seems like something simple, but it's really not, especially when kids have to carry stuff around. So thank you for the program. So thank you for for your first holding you know as a spot. So we appreciate that. And was that the reason that you chose backpacks because they're such fundamental, needy item for students? It is, yeah. So we um so in addition to the backpack, we actually supply school supplies as well. So we buy pens, pencils, notebook, composition notebooks, spiral notebooks, highlighters, markers. So even the smallest things that you may think that a student use uh, in their day-to-day -day school supplies, um, we try to provide that and put those in the backpack. So we set them together before we distribute them. So that way it's already set for a student ready to go on their first day of school. And do you do them K through 12 kind of We thing? do, yes. So um, the kindergartners get crayons maybe? Yes, they cool. do, yeah. And, yeah. and we do utilize color pencils uh, for the higher grade levels. Okay. Yeah, because there's nothing like the smell of crayons when you're little. That is true, yeah. That's very cool. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Jake. Oh, first Jake. Uh, I saw on the some of the pictures, you have like, where do you warehouse this material? Uh, is, do you have like a base that you're out of? Or? Um, so if the first couple of years, we were utilizing Dr. Yu's um, office, um, which is at the downtown center and um, at, at, at her house, in her house as well. Um, we had a actual uh, get together. 
of our parent mentors who um, we worked with CARES and we just kind of set up a bunch of tables in the backyard and set up an assembly line and just put all the bags together. And we were fortunate to use um, a, a factory of this past year um, over on the west side, um, the new company where they allowed us to store uh, the materials and school supplies there. And then we got together again, just created a supply line, assembly line to, to put supplies together. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you for putting pictures too. Those are super helpful. Yeah. John. I agree about the pictures. Uh, I'm curious about numbers. Can you can you talk a little bit about how many how many backpacks we're talking about? Uh, sure. Maybe um, so about cost per backpack and that, that sort of thing. Including yeah. all the, the, the supplies. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for this um, year, we are it's a total of uh, fifteen thousand uh, that we are asking for, and that includes the backpacks and the individual school supplies. Um. So we initially started off um, a few years ago of doing about five hundred and fifty. Try then we increased it to seven fifty once we start to be able to partner. Uh, with the city of Binghamton, but the past couple of years we've been doing a thousand families, and we've there's been no backpacks left over every year that that we've done this. People, and you know, as Brandy's mentioned, will come up and ask, you know, are there still any backpacks left over? And so, because we do this, we try to do multiple days throughout uh, the summer just to accommodate family schedules, and so we make sure that we go to different community neighborhoods in the city, uh, to so that way we can meet the families where they are, and it is always jam-packed um regardless of whatever spot we have gone to um during 2020 during the pandemic year we partnered with the city of binghamton um to set up sites at a couple of the elementary schools that were doing the summer lunch programs um and again it was just you know in the mean though we were you know kind of out of the week uh, with the pandemic people still came out in large droves to get backpacks just because you know, there were so many unknowns, especially for families during that year who might have lost a job. You know, just getting to get that backpack was a, a great benefit to them. Wow. So does that does that put cost per backpack? I see. I do see the breakdown here now in terms of uh, each supply cost for like fifteen bucks a backpack with the five hundred. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, um. Sorry, just me. I just want to give you my card because I'd like to partner with you guys. I'm uh, the general manager for the Greater Good Grocery Store on the north side of Binghamton. So I'd like to partner with you guys and kind of help out because we I have something planned for um, around that time. So I'd like to give you my card just so that way I could kind of work with you guys. I have. To. I Please. didn't want to mention that last year we gave out a thousand backpacks at seven locations. I think we were doing it in within 50 minutes most of the backpacks were gone so it's it's a it's a real need we were turning people away you know do you have any idea how many people you had to turn away i do because i i wrote their names down so i could make sure that they were first in line next year so we mm. turned away 75 people wow. i like that a lot yeah Oh, you keep, you get names. You I get track. names of everyone that we can't give a backpack to. Just I, if there's just another track, so they don't like, I'm, unfortunately, they can jump, you know. Well, they, they don't really jump the, 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 because we try to do them all. I mean, last year we tried to do them pretty quickly, you know, so people are not generally jumping. And we're a small group, so we're manning these tables yeah. again and again. So most of us are sitting at multiple sites. So okay. yeah, I, that, that, I, that's that been brought up to us before. I haven't seen that to be a problem. Generally, we have people who just really need these backpacks. And again, as, as Andre said, when you have multiple kids, it is really yeah, a lot. Awesome. And I think for us, the ideal of a kid going to school, not having a backpack, you know, when other kids yeah. have backpacks is something that's a, is a problem. Yeah, 75 is a lot. Yeah. yeah, 75 little broken hearts. Yeah, yeah. 75 was a lot. So I think for some of them, I found other places that were giving away backpacks that we we said, mm -hmm. if you can get there. Some of the times you can't get there because transportation is an issue, you know, which is why we try to go a different location. But they do them in Vesto. They do them other places also. It's just that people might not be able to get there. But 75 was a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of people that that we had to turn away. And then we even had the city reach out to us. Because oh. people reached out to the city asking for backpacks, and we had none. 
so I have two questions quickly. Um, everybody that comes, you just you you assume the need, you give them the backpack. Yeah, well, we we fill out the the paperwork. There's okay, there yeah. is there yeah. is some sort of tracking mechanism yeah, tracking as far as income. Is, is that how it works? Yeah, we don't we don't we we make or some just, assumptions around income. Most of the people that come are living in the city of Binghamton. Okay, they're coming with multiple kids because you need to bring your children. Okay, and yeah. Um, if people don't show up, I mean, these are good backpacks, right? But if you have money, these are not great backpacks. Mm -hmm. These are not the backpacks you buy if you have a lot of money, you know. And these supplies are are good. I mean, they're really good supplies. But I don't think people that are, are coming there are going to take advantage of us. No, yeah. no. I, I just wanted to know what your screening process was like. Because yeah. when you see those little faces, how can you say no? I mean, this is, yeah. Um, and the other question I had is, do you take private donations for backpacks We did. Last well? year, we got some donations from... Um, Dick's Sporting Goods, we're reaching out to them again because they gave us bigger backpacks, which is really helpful for the high school students. Uh, so we're hoping to reach back out to them. Yes, we do take donations. But how about people who want to help you? Is there an outreach for that mechanism as well? We have so far mostly used just people who have been connected with our programs. We were, go we were going to reach out to the high school because I understand high school kids need service projects. Uh, you know, we use, I mean, I'm a, I'm a professor at university in human development, so I call upon the students in my department who come out and help. But we, we usually get a lot of people helping. That's not usually been our issue. Because I'm thinking there are people around this table that would donate to buy backpacks yeah. after here, yeah. after seeing your pictures, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very cool what you guys do. I'll be Any... less subtle. Will you accept a check from us at some point or me? Uh, we do. We actually have a, a, uh, website you can make a donation oh, okay. on that's, the website that goes that would be great cares.com it's um caresadvocates.org dot org okay thank you for that any other questions michelle uh do you so do the um people that come do they have to show proof of residency like you know, we haven't we haven't really had people showing proof of residency. I have to tell you, though, you know, probably 70 percent of the people that are coming are walking. So they're not driving up. They're walking to the different areas. So. I was just asking just because um, I volunteer at the Samaritan House. Mm -hmm. So I know what our process is. And it's I was just wondering if it was something similar. As yeah, far as yeah, we really, we ha yeah, we haven't had people show IDs or anything like that to show proof of residency. I guess we made some assumptions, mm -hmm. but I think it's been. I like I just have always felt confident that people weren't coming from Union and the Cod to get our backpacks. But thank you. Yeah, it's a pretty specific use item, and yeah. if you don't need it, you don't need it, right? Yeah, this is. Yeah, I mean, last year we also added, you know things like hand sanitizers and oh, yeah. we put in masks for kids. We had a publisher donate books. So we were able oh, to put wow. books in a backpack, you know, for kids. And so it's just expanded, but it's, it's a huge contribution that the city makes. We could not do this without the city, you know, at the level that we're doing it. And it's, it, you no, know, we need more than what we give out. So we appreciate the help. Just, just so the body's aware, the the original funding for this from the city came out of the COVID funding, the CDBG COVID funding, and the whole point was uh, working with CARES, we were able to distribute to um, students and their families contact information for some of the city's COVID programs, and then we also, you know, work with them to, you know, talk about sanitizer, masks, and that kind of thing, so I thought it was a good way of um, really, like, sort of, like, you know, two birds, one stone kind of thing, where they're distributing to, to the kids anyway. So we're able to jump in there, help them out with that, and also help with the whole COVID thing. And I think you guys have been doing sanitizer every year since. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's that's just that keeps that going. And that's good. Cause honestly, I don't know if you know this, kids are kids a lot of a lot of germy kids out there. So getting them some uh some hand sanitizer, some mat. Absolutely. And on that note. <laughs> okay.
Thank so, you very much. Uh, to, uh, can I tell you a little bit about the Each One Teach One Absolutely. tutorial program? No, no. So it's a virtual tutorial program that we started last spring. We got funding to start this program last spring. We realized that because of the because of COVID, but even prior to COVID, there was a dis, there was a disproportional difference in the terms of how the children of color were doing in reading and math in the city schools. And so COVID just exasperated that problem, not just here, but across the country. Mm -hmm. So we were doing a, we, we did a virtual program for a couple of reasons. One, it would be the kids wouldn't have to travel to it. You know, they could be at home. The second reason was we wanted to engage families in the learning experiences. So the families have, an adult has to be there during the tutorial experience. And we also wanted to provide academic support, but we wanted to add a social emotional component. So we have students from BU primarily, although we did have a couple of retired teachers last year, which was kind of cool. And what they do is they spend an hour to hour and a half each week with the student, getting to know them, trying to support them academically, but also making sure that they were they're doing okay. You know, that, that things are going okay in their life. We have a couple of social workers on our board who donate their time. If there's a need, if the family has a need that we can address or we can help them get some problems, we offer them an opportunity to speak with one of the social workers, you know, and they donate time to speak to them. If the kid, if the, the student has some problems that they want to address, we offer them an opportunity to speak with the social worker. And it's not just once on a continual basis. So we were able to service 30 students with 15 tutors. Each tutor tutored two students. And we did this last spring and we were able to move students from failing to passing. We took, we took students who were slated to go to summer school who did not have to go to summer school. And we had a student who was going to um, fail their grade who did not fail their grade. So we had 30 students and they all went the, the 25 weeks that we had funding for and they were able to you know, be successful. We had like 100% success rate, no one did work. But we did a lot of work, we reach out to them a lot. We don't let them slip. We get our students by partnering with the schools and the guidance counselors who identify students who are in trouble and they feed them to us and so we work with the guidance counselors to kind of like your students, we can't catch them, get them back into, you know, get them back to the tutor, make sure that they are continually connecting with us. So we get a lot of help from the schools and that support. We got funding again for this program for this spring from the, the Broome County Youth Bureau. So we're doing it again, but again, we have funding only to support 30 students and 15 tutors. All the funding goes to the, the tutors and we have an incentive program for the students that they make it through all the weeks, then they get a stipend at the end for, for making it through all the weeks. And for the benefit of our audience, can you tell us how much money you're asking for that program? We're asking for 44,000, only oh, seconds. We're asking 43,200 because we would, we would like to double our program. We would like to service 60 students and hire 30 tutors. So the funding would go to the, the, the tutors and then send it to the, the students. And we also, because we require an adult be with the student during the tutorial, we, we try to either give them money to purchase a pizza or we buy pizza for them so they don't have to worry about providing a meal for that hour, or for that day that they're doing the tutorial. So to incentivize family engagement in the learning process. Do you feel that 60 students is, I mean, how, how much of a need is there out there, would you say? If you oh, could? I think there's, I mean, it's a tremendous need, you know, our students are, are not doing well and, and mm -hmm. it's not just here, you know. I think um, people are still trying to catch up from COVID. You know, the the students of color that, that we target, but don't work with exclusively. We will work with any student that applies to the program, but the students of color were already behind before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. 
So they're just, they're even further behind. You know, so it, it's a tremendous need. Yeah. Okay. But there's lots of research that shows that these, you know, um, online tutorials work and they've been really successful. I had my granddaughter in an online tutorial. She's a seven, she's seven years old and she fell behind in reading, you know, and I'm not an expert in teaching a seven-year-old to read. So I got a tutor, a virtual tutor who was mm -hmm. able to kind of help her catch up. So any questions? We thank you very much, right, not only for the presentation, but for what you're doing for this community. Thank, thank you. Thank you all so much for the time. Thank you. And last but not least, we have the BLDC. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Glose. I'm the executive director of the Binghamton Local Development Corporation. Um, I'm also a teacher at the university, and this is my class. Thank you very much for having them here. <laughs> um, by virtue of my position as the director of economic development for the city of Binghamton, I could you move the microphones just a tad closer? Yes, I can. Is that good? Thank you. Perfect. As close as possible. <laughs> Um, by virtue of my position as exec or as um, director of economic development for the city of Binghamton, I serve as the executive director of the Binghamton Local Development Corporation. Uh, both organizations, um, we, a lot of the work overlaps, but the CDBG funds that we receive from the city uh, fund both of those activities. So overall, our uh, work falls into three buckets. The primary is business assistance. So we support businesses across the city of Binghamton with our community development block grant allocation. We focus on those census tracts, um, both entrepreneurs and businesses located in census tracts that um, meet our CDBG requirements. Um, so even though we support businesses and entrepreneurs across the city, the funds from our CDBG allocation support specifically those census tracts that are most impacted um, by poverty. Uh, so business assistance can look a lot of different ways. Our primary um, method of support is financial. Uh, so we have revolving loan funds um, available through the BLDC that we provide to businesses across uh, the city. We also support them through a variety of just informational activities, um, relocation services, business services, triaging them out to other services in the community that might better suit them depending on where they are in their entrepreneurial business journey. Um, we help troubleshoot when they have issues through our permitting process or any other processes at the city of Binghamton. Um, aside from business, business assistance, we also work on planning activities. Um, so we coordinate with our department of planning and community development to uh, help support um, the development of plans across the city that enable us to leverage additional funds from the state and federal government. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else. Most of what we do every day um, affects a census tract that is um, eligible for CDBG funding. We code all of our time to different activities and then track it against our CDBG allocations. And um, Steve might be able to jump in on some of the specific numbers for questions, but we do a, a lot of stuff. So I'm curious to know what you guys are most interested in hearing about. So I'll take any questions. Quite honestly, what you do is so large that it would be difficult for us to hone in on one thing. Um, are there any specific questions or Steve, do you have, oh, Brandy. Um, are you guys responsible for the two properties that are like, uh, what is that? Court, Main and Front Street. There's two vacant properties that uh, that have like the BDLC sign, the one next door to Despina's and the one next door to Red Jug. So we do not own them. Um, they were funded through a New York State Main Street grant um, that I believe, uh, I'm gonna, you're testing my memory here. I believe it was 2019 or 2020 um, before my time in this position, but we do not own them, but we did help facilitate the funding to those properties. Um. So, just it's just I walk past those two things and it it, it looks kind of sad that they're really nice uh properties. Uh, it looks like they're very well done, but they're empty. Do you guys do you guys like 
a so do you when you plan to to repair or whatever do you plan a business for it or is it just you're just spending money to make it look nice and then there's nothing in there yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for those two particular properties, uh, my understanding is they're owned by the same property owner. The New York State Main Street funding um, is a funding stream through New York State, um, the Department of State, where it primarily focuses on facade renovation. So it is a little bit of aesthetic um, work that's being done. The goal of the program is to um, increase the stability and aesthetics of the building so that a business can be successful in that. We have been in communication with the property owner about his plans. Um, we are slowly but surely trying to advance those conversations. We have the same concerns that you do. Lots of state money went into those properties. They look beautiful, but they are empty. Um, so that is something that we are actively working on with the property owner. We don't have a resolution at this time, but we are um, hoping that over the next year, we can continue to work with him to put viable businesses in those locations. <laughs> <laughs> We're a very proactive committee. Of course. <laughs> Steve, do you have anything that you want? What you do is so complicated. Uh, we're, we're looking at your very lovely blue list, which is really nice. Thank you very much for that. Of course. Um, I guess if we have no other questions, you well, can. One thing I will say, just because, Marianne, you and I have worked on this together, um, one of the activities that we funded through the BLDC this year was the creation of a Clinton Street Neighborhood Business yeah, District Revitalization Plan. I was going to ask you about plan. that, but I wasn't yes. sure it was the appropriate place to do that. Well, it's a, it was a, a really successful project developing that plan. What we are waiting on now is, um, fingers crossed, an announcement from the state that we were awarded grant funds. Do we have funds. a time frame? We are hoping next week. Um, really? They have announced... Six of the 10 regions, um, they just restarted announcements this week after about a two week break. Uh, we are very optimistic that we'll be successful in finding out early next week, but not counting my chickens before they're hatched on that one. Because if that comes through, I will be like my friend Brandy, who will walk by and say, they're lovely, but they're empty. What are you going to do about it? So we'll hold your feet to the fire. Absolutely. And I will give you all the property owners numbers, because if anybody can make this happen, I cool. trust this board. <laughs> very cool. No, we appreciate that. No Thank problem. you very much. No problem. And we have an annual report as well. If you're interested in, in reading that, I'm happy to distribute that to the committee. We will keep that in mind. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having my class. I really appreciate yes. it. Now do they get to go home? No, they get to go back to class with me. Oh, I have a whole module planned sorry, on we tried, development guys. block grants. Oh. <laughs> it's a it's three hour class, five fifty to eight fifty uh -huh. on Wednesday oh. nights. So it's a seminar, yeah. If you want to go to grad school, you can hang out with me for three hours on a Wednesday night. Oh. Most of them are smiling. It's okay. <laughs> They know that you're watching. They know their grade <laughs> depends on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Come back anytime. We went too fast for them. <laughs> yeah. They're like, darn it. Okay. Yeah, I will. I just let these guys go first. Did we uh, approve the minutes before we started or no? Yeah, we're, we're going to get, you know, it, it, you know, we let our guests go first, right? Yeah. Then we'll let everybody know the guests here, and then we'll do the minutes, and then we'll talk about next steps. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, it's about to get worse, huh? The brass, the, the brass. Well, considering your neighbors, what we've heard, we're not surprised. <laughs> That's a fact. Where'd she go? <laughs> Yeah. They're lucky I don't live next door to them. <laughs> I don't know. I was just going to announce that she's on oh, here. She is. Um, 140. So it's on the back. It's on the back. And it's really something that the mayor decides to do. So. Um, let the record show that Deborah Hogan had joined us previously before yeah. some of our presentations. And right now we will entertain the approval of the minutes. Does anybody have any comments on, yes, your name was not spelled right again? I think, I think Steve spelled my name right. I think he did. So uh, you don't have to change it like he, yeah. Do 
She she catches the smaller things. She's amazing. <laughs> so I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting on February 1st, 2023. Any second? I second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are passed. The last thing we have to talk about tonight is what comes next. Okay, so um, those of you who aren't aware, what we have hired a consultant to do the home ARP plan, um, that's sort of running coterminous with this body. Uh, a survey just went up to, or a link to a survey just went in the paper. I'll send you guys, I, I forgot to do that earlier, send you guys a link to the survey and I'll send it to the community development um, List serve as well. Um, we'll have a Spanish version here in a day or so, and I'll post it on the city website. So that's sort of going on then. Now, at some point, um, the company Chrysalis uh, and Mr. Jason Wright out of Atlanta will be presenting to this body um, because, in theory, yes, you need to kind of get his budget and then okay it and then it goes on to the mayor's office to okay it and then so there's like we're extremely tight so um although modifications can be made it's kind of really encouraged to kind of go with what he's going he's going to put forward because that's going to be based off of surveys public feedback and all the other stuff so uh we should be having a public hearing i think maybe your guys public hearing and the public hearing for this will be done at the same time i'll have to double check that but, on the um, same day Yes, we can do we can do public hearing two public hearings at the same same day. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but currently, other than that, the next step uh, we're going to have the stakeholder meeting on the eighth. Um, that's the non-applicant stakeholders uh, groups like um, the one of the local veterans groups I invited DSS um, Rise. Basically, any agency who's not applying for money but can represent a solid body of groups that may be impacted or affected. Uh, office raging is, is another one. So, but it's any agency that has not applied for funds and is not seeking funds, because then you're going to at least get hopefully an unbiased perspective on someone who's not trying to, uh, you know, not to, uh, not a detriment to the people requesting funding. But every everybody every agency requesting funding is always going to make it that their group is the most in need of funding. And but that's what they are. They are representatives of those groups. So. Um, but, and especially if they're seeking funding from other agencies like you guys. So hopefully uh, we did this last year and it worked out really good. It was very informative, um, especially RISE. I actually learned a lot um, from the RISE group when they came. So um, any of the- RISE, the RISE group does what? For domestic violence. So RISE does the domestic violence um, in the area. Um, any agencies, I, I sort of sent out a tentative schedule, but you know, they may say no or something might change, but they were also given a uh, the, the list, the um, not the uniform sheet, because that's more for the agencies applying, but a separate sheet. I don't know if you remember, there was a sheet last year for those specific agencies, yeah. Yeah. and I just reused that one for this. So okay. that'll be on the 8th. I believe I currently have the 22nd for the public hearing. Um, once the public hearing is done, the next two meetings on the 4th and uh, the 5th and the 19th of April, those are the fun ones. Uh, that is the those are the budget meetings. Now we normally have two of them, but sometimes it can be done in one. Um, I will get uh, pizza, and uh, so let me know if you have any preferences for your pizza. Um, and we will basically have a few hours of uh, yelling and screaming at each other. Um, no. And it's a good time. It's a good time. We yell and scream um, at the fact that we don't have enough money. And that, and that's, and honestly, and that, that's, that's really what it's going to come down to uh, is, it, it, and that's, it, it, it's that tiny, tiny pie that you guys have, are left with divvying it up. And everybody's going to have those agencies you like more, like, you know, like more than others, and you're going to fight for them. And I'm going to tell you this, that's what you should do. Absolutely. Whatever agencies that you like, you should fight for your the agencies you like because you represent members of the community. You are representing their interests here. So if you feel like your community is not being, uh, the certain members of your community not being served and we need additional funding for service agencies to affect that that group, then you need to fight for it. So, I mean, don't, don't, feel, don't feel ashamed of it. But, you know, you guys have to compromise too because this budget requires at least seven yays. It is not a simple majority. You have to have at least seven members say, yes, I approve this budget. So 
Um, that's going to be those two meetings. Um, normally the first meeting. Pizza. Yes. Deb, did you have something? Oh. Yes, Steve, going back to your stakeholders meeting. Yes. Could you please invite uh, Southern Tier Independence Center? If I did. Perfect. Thank you. So the the um, I'm trying to like brainstorm what I did. It was housing and poverty would be DSS. Uh, um, disabled, I, I hate to use that term, but the, the disability access uh, would be stick. Um, I think I'm trying to remember if I invited staff or not um, for LGBTQ. Um, maybe I didn't. Maybe I need to. Let me double check that one. A uh, veterans group, one of the local veterans groups, um, and Rise for Domestic Violence and Office for Aging for Seniors. So those seem to be like, if you kind of like looked at that, that you're going to sort of umbrella in pretty much everyone uh, that might fall outside the, the sort of normal, well, I hate to say the word normal, but fall outside of the, uh, uh, of being represented. It. So I think by including all of them, we would get we will get everybody, including all the, the agencies that applied. So, but yes, I definitely did a, a thing, and they sent me something which was not technically what I had asked for, but it was something else. I got to review that, but it was this morning, and I would I didn't have a chance to look at it yet. Um, but that's going to be yeah, that's going to be on the eighth. So, uh, going back to the budget, I'll have the Excel spreadsheet. We'll have it posted up here. It's a pretty simple one. We changed it last year or last two years. I can't remember, and I think it worked out better. Where we had the the separate sheets for you know, your service agencies, so you could yeah. easily tell who you were dealing with, and the separate sheet for the capital projects, so you could tell who was getting what. So, um, because it's no longer we're going to give two hundred thousand dollars to streets, it's we're going to give two hundred thousand to streets to do these specific streets. Um, same thing with parks projects. So you're you're going to be very specific. Now these things can change over the course of the year, depending. Um, but that's just the way nature, that's just the way, you know, it rolls. Um, we try to stick with the the, the, the road projects, but, uh, and the, the parks projects, but things can happen at the last minute and that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, that's where we're at with that. And then after the 19th, once, well, I mean, the budget could be approved by the 5th, but assuming it takes two, uh, then the chair will need to present to um, city council and the mayor's office, your recommendations. So make sure as you guys are working on the budget, the reasons and the specificities of why you're wanting to fund agency A for X amount is passed on to her. She needs to know. She needs to know why, because when city council asks, why, why are you recommending only funding this group this amount, she knows. Um, once that's done, you guys are pretty much done. You get a summer break, have fun. Um, and then uh, we'll meet back again in the fall um, I say this every year, but I really need to stick to it this year. I will be doing on-site monitoring visits in the summer. I will let you guys know. Um, I somehow they keep slipping away from me and HUD's getting mad at me. So I got to stop doing that. Um, but other than that, uh, I think that's where everything, I mean, the mayor's office will still have to approve. They'll, they'll still have to make a budget record. Oh, mayor's office numbers. So I removed, I was originally going to have the mayor's office do a presentation, but the meeting was getting kind of long and I'm glad we excluded them. Um, they will give me numbers and I will pass them on to you. So uh, once I have those numbers, I will let you know. If you have any issues about anything, you can obviously, of course, contact the mayor's office, contact Megan and uh, communicate uh, if you if you feel any of those numbers are unreasonable. But um, the mayor's prerogative is that they he, he can choose and the mayor's office can choose specific numbers to fund. I mean, that's that's kind of their, that's his job. So um, just be aware of that, but he does, I, I do know that they are aware that you value your, he values your input and he wants you to know, you know, that, that he values your input. So, um, and I think letting, having him present numbers to you ahead of time sort of gets, gets over some of those things. So you're not just, you know, we're going to fund these agencies and yeah, he's like, mm, no, I'm going to fund these agencies. Be, yeah. So once he tells you, you know, we're going to fund this for this and this for that, and this is for that. Once you have those numbers, then you can work around with what's, you know, the, the remainder and understand. Yeah. Also, you can understand what agencies or programs or whatever may not be, not be, not be included in the mayor's planned approvals. And you guys can focus on those as well. 
So it does give you guys that option of looking at these things and figuring out sort of like a side angle here of, of getting And in. last year we did take him our, our concerns about funding issues and he listened to us and changed and went with what we had recommended. So that was pretty cool. First time that that ever happened. So, um, so Steve, just to clarify, the chrysalis thing, is that the next meeting, which is two weeks from now, which would be? The which one? The, the first group that you talked about this the stakeholders no, the meeting. stakeholders is in march is there any meeting on the 20 i mean the 29th of february would be two mm. weeks from now no 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 the next meeting will be the eighth would be the eighth yes. okay all right because that, that was i wasn't quite clear about okay so we don't have to worry about anything until the eighth and um, um take your vitamins for april I will say this, if the home ARP issue requires us to have an emergency meeting, I'll let you know. Hopefully it will not. Um, I'm hoping we're going to be able to work within the time frame, but we have to have a plan to HUD by the end of March. So it's a, it's a, it's a very tight uh, constraint on this. Okay. How, how much notice would you give us? I what? mean, I mean, if that were to happen. Well, you mean like an emergency meeting? Yeah. As soon as I found out, I would let you guys know. But I mean, you probably at least a week ahead of time. Because it wouldn't be on a Wednesday because we'd have to figure out exactly how we yeah, okay. do it. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd we'd need to be flexible. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Just a comment that I won't be here in March. So I hope everybody else will be. So there's quorum. <laughs> <laughs> um okay, what can we make her do when she comes back in April? She brings the soda. You, 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 bring the, you bring the drinks, okay? You bring the whatever people like to drink with their pizza. Okay. But not what we need to be drinking. We can't have that, but, you know. So I guess we, we, we are ready to close. And we will have our final uh, attendance, beginning with John. John Brunza, Mayor of Pinky. Brandy Brown, District 3. Justin McGregor, District 7. Kenya Middleton, Mayor Pointy. Marianne Callahan, 1st District. Michelle O'Loughlin, 5th District. Marilyn Austin, 6th District. Jacob Kumpan, Council at Large. Deborah Hogan, Merrill appointee. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Did you, did you make a motion? I make a motion oh, that we adjourn this meeting. That. See, I took, I took imperial powers. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll second. All in favor. Oh, sorry. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Pick a better chairman. <laughs> Bye.